There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, nor any courses like a page of prancing poetry. Good evening. This is Nelson Armstead. From the thousands of short stories written in almost every language in the earth, it's our pleasure to select and prepare the best and bring them to life for you. Tonight, the story is by John Russell, about a beachcomber and his beautiful set of red whiskers. And it's entitled, The Price of the Head. The possessions of Christopher Alexander Pellet were these. His name, which he was always careful to retain intact, a suit of ducks, no longer intact, in which he lived and slept, a continuous thirst for liquor, and a set of red whiskers. Also, he had a friend. How was one to explain the loving devotion lavished upon Christopher Alexander Pellet by Karaki, the company boat boy? This was the mystery at Fufuti. There was no harm in Pellet. On the other hand, there was no perceptible good in him. He had long lost the will to toil and latterly even the skill to beg. In any other part of the world, he would have passed on without a struggle. But some chance had drifted him to these Polynesian beaches where life is as easy as a song and his particular fate had given him a friend. So he persisted. That was all. He persisted. A sodden lump of flesh preserved in alcohol. Karaki, his friend, was a heathen from Bougainville where some people are smoked and others are eaten. Being a black, a Melanesian. He was as much an alien in brown fufuti as any white. He was a serious, efficient little man with deeply sunken eyes, a great mop of kinky hair, and a complete absence of expression. His tastes were simple. He wore a red cotton kerchief belted around his waist and a brass curtain ring suspended from his nose. Some powerful chief in his home island had sold Karaki into the service of a trading company for three years, annexing his salary of tobacco and beads in advance. And when the time should be accomplished, Karaki would be shipped back to Bougainville, a matter of some 800 miles, where he would land no richer than before except in experience. This was the custom. Now, Karaki would stand in the shade of the copra shed until Moy Jack, the Chinese half-caste, would thrust the sagging bulk of pellet out of doors. He took it scientifically by wrist and armpit and swung toward the beach to the little fat shelter of pandanus leaves that was all his home. Tenderly, he eased Pellet to a mat, pillowed his head, bathed him with cool water, brushed the filth from his hair and whiskers. Pellet's whiskers were true whiskers, the kind that sprout like the barbels of a catfish, and they were a glorious coppery sun-gilt red. Karaki combed them out with a sandalwood comb. Later, he sat by with a fan and kept the flies from the bloated face of the drunkard. It was a little past noon, one fine cloudless day, when Karaki emerged from the shelter. All Fufudi was asleep. Nobody would have been mad enough to stir abroad in the noon hour of repose. Nobody but Karaki, the untamed black who cared nothing for custom. He flitted to and fro like a wraith, applying himself to a job for which he'd never been hired. He broke open the trade room and selected three bolts of turkey red cloth, a few knives, two cases of tobacco, a fine small axe, a Winchester, and some ammunition. And with the axe, he smashed the bottoms out of the whale boat and the two cutters so that it'd be of no use to anyone for many days to come. It was really a very handy little axe, a true tomahawk, ground to a shaving edge. Karaki took a workman's pleasure in his keen, deep strokes. It was almost his chief prize. On the beach lay a big proa, a stout outrigger canoe of the kind Karaki's own people used at Bougainville, so high of prow and stern as to be nearly crescent-shaped. Of supplies, he had to make a hasty selection. He took a bag of rice, another of sweet potatoes. He took as many cocoa nuts as he could carry in a net in three trips. He took a cask of water and a box of biscuits. And when all was ready, Karaki went back to his thatch and aroused Christopher Alexander Pellet. Hey, Master, you come long me. Mr. Pellet sat up and looked at him. Too late, said Mr. Pellet profoundly. This shop is closed. Copy boy, give all those dirty loafers good night. I'm, I'm going to bed. Whereupon he fell flat on his back. Karaki knelt beside him, pried him up until he could get a shoulder under his middle, and lifted him like a loose bag of meal. Somehow he managed to get him aboard the proa. No man saw their departure. Fofuti still dreamed on. 
Long before the agent awoke to wrath and ruin, their queer, uh, queer crescent craft had slipped from the lagoon and faded away in the wings of a trade wind. That first day, Karaki had all he could do to keep the proa running straight before the wind. Big, smoky seas came piling up out of the southeast and would have piled aboard if he'd been given the least chance. He was only a heathen who didn't know a compass from a degree of latitude. But his forefathers used to people these waters and cockle-shell voyages that made the venture of Columbus look like a ferry boat trip. Karaki bailed with a tin pan and sailed with a mat and steered with a paddle, but he proceeded. Long about sunrise, Mr. Pellet stirred in the bilge and raised a pea-green face. He took one bewildered glance overside at the seething waste and collapsed with a groan. And after a decent interval, he tried again, but this was an illusion that wouldn't pass. And he twisted around to Karaki, sitting crouched and all glistening with spray in the stern. Rum, he demanded. Karaki shook his head, and a haunted look crept into Pellet's eyes. Take, take away all that stuff, he begged, pointing at the ocean. Thereafter, for two days, he was very, very sick, and he learned how a small boat in any kind of sea can move 47 different ways within one and the same minute. On the third day, he awoke with a mouth and a stomach of fumed leather and a great weakness, but otherwise in command of his faculties. He looked forward and aft, to windward and to lee. There was a great deal of horizon in sight, but nothing else. And for the first time, he was aware of the strangeness in events, but he was in no condition to question. Pellet had other things to think of. Some of the things were pink, and others purple, and others were striped like the rainbow in the most surprising designs, and all were highly novel and interesting. You can't cut off alcohol from a man who's been continuously pickled for two years without results more or less picturesque. Tied hand and foot and lashed under a thwart, Pellet raved. It would have been singular hearing had there been anybody to hear, but there was only Karaki who didn't care for poetry. Now and then he threw a dipper full of seawater over the white man or spread a mat to keep the sun from him or fed him with coconut milk by force. Karaki was a poor audience, but an excellent nurse. Also, he combed Pellet's whiskers twice every day. My heart is within me as an ash is in the fire. Whosoever hath seen me without loot, without lyre, shall sing of me grievous things, even things that were ill to desire. Thus chanted Christopher Alexander Pellet, whose face began to show a little more like flesh and a little less like rotten kelp. Whenever a fair chance offered, Karaki landed in the lee of some one of the tiny islets with which the Santa Cruz region is peppered and would make shift to cook rice and potatoes in a tin dipper. One day, two white men in a cutter came to stop them. Karaki couldn't hide his resemblance to a runaway Negro, and he didn't try to. But when the cutter approached within 50 yards, he suddenly announced himself as a runaway Negro with a gun. He left the cutter sinking and one of the men dead. There's a bullet hole alongside me here, said Pellet a little later. You'd better plug it. Karaki plugged it and released his passenger, who sat up and began stretching himself with a certain naive curiosity of his own body. So you're real, observed Pellet, staring hard at Karaki. By George, you are, and that's comfort. I say, where are you taking this mess of a canoe? Balbi, said Karaki, using the native word for Bougainville. Pellet whistled. 800 miles in an open boat was a considerable undertaking. It enlisted his respect. Balbi is your home? Yes. All right, Commodore, lead on. I don't know why you shipped me for supercargo, but I'll see you through. Strangely, or perhaps not so strangely, the whole Fufuri interval of his history had been fading from his brain while the poison was ebbing from his tissues. The Christopher Alexander Pellet that emerged was one from earlier days. Pretty much of a wreck, it was true, but ordinarily human and rather more than ordinarily intelligent. He was very feeble at first, but Karaki's diet of coconuts and sweet potatoes did wonders for him. And the time came when he could rejoice in the good salt taste of the spray in his lips and forget for hours together the crazy craving for stimulant. They made a strange crew, this pair, simple, savage, and convalescent drunkard. Now on the 36th day from Fufuri, they sighted Choisul, a great green wall that built up slowly across the west. And when they came ashore on the islet, they were both nearly starved, but they were alive. For a week they stayed while Pellet fattened on unlimited coconut and Karaki tinkered on the proa. Across the stretch of water was Bougainville, Karaki's home, where he would be beyond the reach of white men's law and punishment. So Karaki was content, and so was Christopher Alexander Pellet. His body had been wrung and swept and scoured, and he drowned his devils. Sweet air and sunshine were on his lips and in his heart. Oh, this is good. Good, he said. 
Karaki puzzled him. He thought of this taciturn savage, how he'd capped thankless service with rarest sacrifice. And now that he could consider it soberly, the why of it eluded him. Why? Affection? Friendship? It must be so. And he warmed toward the silent little man with the sunken eyes and the expressionless face from which he could never raise a wink. The Black Islander was inscrutable, incomprehensible, an enigma always and to the end. The end came two days later at Bougainville. Under a gorgeous dawn that came into a bay that opened before their proa as with jeweled arms of welcome, Pellet jumped ashore, declaiming poetry aloud to the alluring solitude when he was aware of a gentle footfall and turned, surprised to find Karaki standing just behind him with the rifle at his hip and the axe in his hand. Pellet said cheerfully, Well, what do you want, old friend? Me like, said Karaki, while there gleamed in his eyes a strange light like the flicker of a turning shark. Me like him too much one head belong you. What? Head? Whose? My head? Yes. That was the way of it. That was all the mystery. The savage had fallen enamored of the head of the beachcomber, and Christopher Alexander Pellet had been betrayed by his fatal red whiskers. In Karaki's country, a white man's head, well smoked, is the thing to be desired above all wealth, above lands and chief ships, fame, and the love of women. In all Karaki's country, there was no head like the head of Pellet. For this, he had schemed and waited, committed theft and murder, expended sweat and cunning, starved and denied himself, nursed, watched, tended, fed, and saved this man, that he might bring the head alive and on the hoof, so to speak, to the spot where he could remove it at leisure and enjoy the fruits of his labor and safety. Pellet saw all this at a flash, understood it so far as any white could understand, the whole elemental and stupendous simplicity of it. And standing there in his new strength and sanity, he gave a laugh that peeled across the waters and started the seabirds from their cliffs, the deep-throated laugh of a man who fathoms and accepts the last great jest. For finally, by corrected list, the possessions of Christopher Alexander Pellet were these. His name, still intact, the ruins of some dusty uh, uh, ducks, his precious red whiskers, and a soul which had been neatly recovered, renewed, refurbished, reanimated, and restored to him by his good friend, Karaki. Thou shouldst die as he dies, for whom none sheddeth tears, filling thine eyes and fulfilling thine ears with the brilliance, the bloom, and the beauty. Thus chanted Christopher Alexander Pellet over the waters of the bay, and then whirled, throwing wide his arms. Come on and shoot! It's cheap at the price! This has been John Russell's short story, The Price of the Head, as presented by Nelson Olmsted, who now has a closing word. Well, next Saturday night, be with us to hear Dead Men by James M. Cain. Until then, good night and good reading. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.